We want to start here today with a story that has become one of the biggest stories around the world, certainly one of the biggest, uh, touches on one of the biggest issues in the U.S. election, that's immigration, what's happening at the Texas border currently. And we are very, very honored for this conversation to be joined once again by Todd Miller, who's an author and journalist specializing in border issues. Todd, thanks so much for being back with us. Thank you, Eugene. It's great to be with you again. Well, great, great to have you here. And I guess my first question is, there's a lot of very potent headlines about what's happening in Texas. People saying, is another civil war coming? Nikki Haley saying today, Texas can secede if they want to. So passions are obviously high. uh, But maybe just give us a sense, what are the actual sort of legal issues at the border that have brought Texas state officials and the federal government into at least some state of conflict, it seems? Yeah, there's, I think there's a lot to this story, and and I unfortunately it's getting churned through the kind of partisan media um, machine, right? Um, but what's 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 happening is that uh, the um, Texas state government, through op- what is called Operation Lone Star, um, which is a, a 4.5 billion dollar operation that Texas started in 2021. Um, that operation is uh, is um, well. It's what happened was that it, it involves Texas police, state police, and um, National Guard, and they took over this this small park in Eagle Pass, Texas, um, and they took it over because they claimed that the U.S. Border Patrol was cutting the concertina wire, and that and that razor wire, and they wanted to stop that. And so there's been a standoff ever since um, that's caught, that's that's been getting played up quite a bit in the media. Um, I want to, you know, the I that's what's going on. My interpretation of this is that we're seeing what I would characterize as border theater. Um, border theater, it's is it any coincidence that this is happening during an election year? No, I don't think so. Is it any coincidence that um, this is happening under the regime regime of a uh, Greg Abbott, the governor of Texas, who's who's all been all about um, securing the border and who is a big Donald Trump supporter? No, I don't think it is. Is it any coincidence this is happening while the the kind of messaging from the right wing um, in the United States is at the border? We have open borders quote unquote, open borders. No. Um, and so, and so I think what I, when I, what I think what we're seeing here and why I call it theater, because what, what is being created is this kind of part, instead of what is really going on in the border, which we can definitely talk about, we're getting this kind of partisan clash. Um, or we, we have a governor who's trying to Promote a promote a message saying that there's an open border and we need to do something more about it. That's making a stand at the small park in Eagle Pass and against the federal government. And then we have the federal government who's in charge. The, the legal issue is that the federal government is in charge of border enforcement. And so this one, this taking over of this small park is is a big, a big challenge to that, maybe even an embarrassment to the federal government. So then we get we get the we get this clash and the conflict. Um, but one thing I wanted to say is that if you look at Operation Lone Star again, it's been in it going on for two two year two years now um, across the state of Texas. This has not happened up to this point. Um, I regularly see Operation Lone Star in action with my own eyes in El Paso. And what you see is the op- the state operation, the National Guard, the police working alongside and collaborating with the U.S. Border Patrol. The, and on top of that, the U.S. Border Patrol has collaborated or is collaborating with police departments, including state to police departments all across the U.S.-Mexico border and Arizona, New Mexico and California as well. And that's been part of their enforcement fabric now for decades and on top of that, the Border Patrol regularly works with National Guard. So we have what appears to be a conflict in one place where in other places these, these forces are working in collaboration with each other. And so how this has been spun and I, in, the, in the media 
has been quite alarming. Like uh, I read from a more liberal point of view yesterday that they were calling, you know, that this might be the quote unquote end of America. And I'm like, what? (laughs) I mean, mean, well, maybe that's a good idea, (laughs) you know, but, but what, what, I mean, what it seems like everything just has reached a new level of hyperbole and this hyperbole is just playing into is really setting the stage, I think, of what we're going to see a lot of this year with the elections coming, a lot of this sort of thing, the sort of bravado of state governments, especially with Republican governors, um, versus the federal apparatus, which which is also a very, it's a very punitive uh, enforcement uh, oriented, um, it, even brutalizing to migrants apparatus. Um, as if they're in conflict with each other when in reality uh, they've worked hand in hand over decades now. So I I think it's important, like everything you're saying is obviously very important. And a lot of it is being framed in the context of like, oh, this harkens to some sort of civil war type situation because you've like the state, uh, you know, opposed to the federal government. But there's also this, sort of like a other narrative in the backdrop, which is Republicans versus Democrats and the upcoming election and what Mm. this means for Trump versus Biden. And obviously Trump, you know, plays on the anti-immigrant sentiment there. Of course, I would imagine is some kind of concern that, that, you know, the far right, especially the organized, violent armed far right, gets very excited uh, whenever anything anti-immigrant uh, happens, especially on a national scale. So I guess I'm curious how you see this playing out politically. But first, I have to just note that we need to clarify here on Breakthrough News that there is no relation, I hope, between Todd Miller and Matt Miller. That's all I want to say. Matt Miller, <laughs> the spokesperson who gets on uh, in front of the podium every day in front of reporters and and embarrasses himself and then goes viral for defending genocide. I just want to throw that out there. I'm assuming there's no relationship between the two of you. That's my dad joke for the day. Eugene (laughs) Eugene was waiting for my dad joke. Um, But no, I'm sorry. Not to make make too much uh, um, of the dark humor in these horrible, horrible times. But no, to go back to what I was saying, Todd, I just, I'm curious if you can speak a bit about the political implications uh, in terms of the upcoming election. Because I think there's something that ends up happening with this narrative. And that is the idea that Democrats and Republicans are somehow like on different sides of this issue. When of course there are some differences at the end of the day, this is happening under Biden, nothing has changed under Biden. So I guess, can you address that? Yeah, um, and that's a, Super good question, because this is kind of what the sort of this is why I would say border theater, because it it creates this notion that these two sides are on opposite ends of and the Democrats are all about, quote unquote, open borders and the Republicans are about secure borders. And that's not what the reality is at all. Right. You So like coming into this election year, if you go to 2023, uh, and the Biden Biden administration had the largest border and immigration enforcement budget ever, $29.8 billion if you take Customs and Border Protection, Immigration and Customs Enforcement. And that translates into the wall, you know, maintenance of 700 miles of walls and barriers, the maintenance of and hi- new hiring of nearly 21,000 U.S. Border Patrol agents, an Air and Marine unit coming out of Customs and Border Protection, basically a basically a domestic air force and Navy. Right. Um, and, and, you know, so, so the, the idea that, that um, there's open borders or the Biden administration isn't continuing the kind of border enforcement in the ramp up of it over the years, like $29.8 billion. I assume once it's all said and done, that'll be similar in 2024 as far as budgets are concerned. That's higher than when Trump ended, right? It's the Trump ended his mm-hmm. his uh his in 2020 with a what was it like a $25 billion budget annual. I'm talking annual budgets here. And so what so Biden's not only has been continuing many of the policies um under Trump and um, but has been piling on the budget to make it even the fortification even 
more. And with an extra stress on technology, an extra stress on this kind of surveillance apparatus, the sophisticated cameras, the robotic dogs, right? The, the UGVs, they call them, or the unmanned ground vehicles, um, the sort of robotic robotization. I always say that word, and I don't even know if that's a word, but it's kind of the, it's like turning, you know, the kind of digitization of the of the border. And this is all happening under under Biden. And I suspect, you know, given the dynamics and given the co- strong criticism that comes from the right and coming out of what's going on in Texas right now, what has happened historically with Democrats, especially in election year, is instead of going towards a more, you know, more, a more, a less sort of uh, enforcement oriented policy or strategy, they go, they even, they double down on it. The iron fist comes down even more. And that's, as we sit here in January, I suspect we're going to see these displays by the Biden administration over until November, um, showing that they are going to be strong on the border And there's every indication, like these border bills that are floating around right now, there's every indication that this is going to happen. You know, one of the things that I'm curious, hoping you can speak to, Todd, as well, is it almost feels like there's like a like a logical fallacy behind this as well. Like the whole concept is if we just have more, you know, quote unquote, security at the border, that people will stop coming. Uh, I don't want to editorialize too much. I just wonder how you respond to that because that seems to underpin sort of both sides of the argument here. Yeah, it's false. I mean, if you just look at uh, the the first real border operations of the modern era, I would call it modern era, but it really, you're talking the 1990s. Mm. But I call it the modern era because there's a deterrent strategy, which still exists today. And those deterrent strategy was basically enforcing the cities. So people couldn't cross, so they could have to cross through like the deserts of the Southwest, which are impassable or really difficult to cross. And 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 the idea with that deterrence, the word would get around that it would be it's dangerous. People are going to die. They call if you go back to the Border Patrol memorandum in 1994, they say mortal danger. Right. They go. People are going to die. Um, that that would stop people from coming. At the same time, 1994, NAFTA, of course, is implemented. Boom, huge displacement issues going on in Mexico, especially with small farmers and lots and lots of people going north. I mean, it didn't like this, this like this. I use that example because that is the prime example, I think, to building up like during those years in the 90s, the border enforcement budget tripled. It made it so much more difficult to cross. But then more people came than ever, ever before. So historically, it really I mean, it doesn't I mean. The deterrence strategy probably does have an effect. I'm sure. I'm sure people hear uh, hear the dangers and have to think twice or three times or four times. But the I, the 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 kind of why people are coming, the the root causes, like what are what are the like why was NAFTA a reason? Why is like giving corporate power the open border to go and do anything they want anywhere in Mexico, right? whether that's like mining entire communities or whatever. Right. Um, and, and, you know, why, like, how can we not make that correlation and, and look at some other policies that really go into a lots of different issues? I mean, when we could, in, in order to do that, we have to have a much longer conversation. We have to unpack like economic situations all throughout, not only in Mexico, all throughout Latin America. We have to look at U.S. history politically in, in all these places. If, if we want to talk about the violence in Central America, oh, well, then we have to unpack that. A lot of times the word violence is thrown out there, but not unpacked. So we just have to think, oh, that's just the natural way of things in whatever country we're talking about. No, it's not. It's, it's there. Those things happen because of lots of root historic reasons. And for me, I think for like the idea of securing the border is, is ridiculous to, to stop people from coming. If you're not considering like these bigger, deeper historic issues or the real life and death issues that people have to make them think, Oh, I got, we're going to try this to help our situation out. Mm -hmm. Well, Todd, thankfully we have authors and journalists like yourself who write in quite a bit on border issues. So I hope everyone has the opportunity to check out all of your work. Where can they find you if they are more interested? 
Oh, uh, go to the borderchronicle.com. I, I, along with another journalist, Melissa Dobolsky, we, we publish every Tuesday and Thursday. And on that website, if you're interested in books, our books, we both have books. Um, it's on, You can find them there and you can see updates to, and all these different stories. This Texas story, we're going to be following that among 100,000 other things, you know, in this next year. Right on. Well, Todd Miller, as always, thanks so much for giving us some of your time here in the Freedom Side. Thank you so much, Eugene and Rania.